Um, so I'm a little nervous, so be kind. <laughs> if I fumble, just wave. Um, like Amy said, if I'm speaking too fast, make me slow down. If I'm moving too slowly, just cue me up to move a little faster. Um, when Judith asked me to keynote today, I, like I said, I, I am nervous. Uh, this is probably the first time I'm giving a keynote address. Um, hopefully not the last. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also exciting because I guess this is a very good opportunity for me to share the work that we're doing in Nairobi and hopefully give you a little piece that you can walk out with today and see how you can replicate in your own uh, communities. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I will take you back to a fairly dark time in Kenyan history. This is the year 2007. The period leading up to our general election was, I mean, it was fairly good. The economy was booming. I was 18 years old, and I was uh, really, really excited at the thought of finally having a say in the choice of leadership in our country. So on the 27th of December, 2007, I even remember that date, that's very weird. Um, I woke up very early, went and stood in line for nearly six hours before I got to cast my vote. Now, normally I'd be very annoyed that you woken me up earlier than 6 a.m. and that you made me stand for six hours without breakfast. <laughs> but in this case, I didn't really care because at the end of the day, I was excited about seeing how far my vote would actually go. Then we waited three days, the results weren't announced, and of course all of us started getting a little angsty, we were a little worried, you know, what's going on, what's happening, why are things moving slower than usual? And then a few days later, the uh, results were announced, and of course, they were largely contested, and that is when all hell broke loose. Violence broke out in different parts of the country. Um, I think we had more than 1,500 people displaced. No, 1,500 people killed, more than 500,000 displaced, and people like myself were stuck in our house with our family, really scared of going out. So we chose to seek solace in the home because we didn't want to venture out into the unknown danger. Um, and I think this is something that most other families also kind of resonated with at that particular time. The mainstream media was unable to report exactly what was going on in all these different parts of the country. Uh, the government was also trying to heavily downplay how serious the situation was. So we were in the dark, basically. And this is when four Kenyan bloggers came together and set up a platform that would allow for ordinary citizens to share information about human rights violations, whether it's riots, whether it's property loss, death, any sort of government forces, just anything revolving around the, around the crisis at that time, and be able to send that via the means they already have access to, whether it's SMS, email, Twitter, and the web form, and have it aggregated on the map uh, like this. And what this did is effectively give Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would. This is how the journey of a Kenyan-born company known as Ushahidi began. Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. Um, and it essentially, like I said before, gave Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would. This dark period allowed us to form a company that not only specializes in developing free and open source software to allow for information collection, aggregation, and visualization, but also provide platforms through which people who are traditionally considered to be passive recipients of information actually have access to this data, make use of it, and have a say in whatever decisions are being made within their own communities. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we do as we move along. But one disclaimer I need to make right now. I don't know if there's anybody in the crowd who understands this. Any James Bond fans in the room? <laughs> so the idea here is that we develop the technology that helps to empower people, but at the end of the day, it's up to you or it's up to the communities to actually go out and save the world. So we won't do it for you, but we'll make sure you have damn good resources to make sure that happens. <laughs> Let's fast forward to the year 2010. I'm a little older. I am in my third year of university. And a friend of mine called Jessica Colasso invited me to the launch of a new space that was going to be a physical nexus point for all tech enthusiasts to work out of. Now, the launch of the iHub is something, or that date is extremely important to me because I think that's what marked the journey, my own personal journey within this technology ecosystem. That's why I'm here now. 
Um, I had never been exposed to the world of having freelancers. I think my idea of a good job after graduating was sitting behind a desk in a fancy suit, working from nine to five and then going home with my money. <laughs> <laughs> And getting exposed to the IHUB at that time when I was still in third year before graduating really helped to show me what the power of tech actually has, the power of being in a community and the power of coming together and actually making a difference in the world. So like I said before, the IHUB is generally just a space, a physical nexus point for all techies and enthusiasts to work out of together. What this place has done ha is to provide a space for creativity without bounds. It's created a sense of community amongst those of us who work within the tech industry. Um, people call it the Silicon Savannah. If you come to Nairobi, you cannot pass through Nairobi without passing through the IHUB because that's where everything tech um, actually happens. And um, it's also provided for, it's created an avenue for techies who would otherwise be isolated to actually interact with users, interact with communities, business mentors, and researchers to make sure that they're providing value with the tools that they're using. Um, and over the last five, yeah, five years of its existence, um, there are four different arms of the IHUB that have been developed. IHUB Research uh, provides a little more insight into what the market trends are and whatever research they do feeds back into the developers who sit within the space to make sure that they're actually building things that are useful for the community out there. The IHUB UX Lab provides um, resources through which people who are actually building these tools can see how the tool interacts with their users. So it could be, you know, you have a mobile application, you want to know where this specific button should fit, where this other one should not be, that kind of thing. So helping you build out your tool in a way that will be a little more intuitive for, um, for the users. And then I have consulting to help link up the developers who have the skill with those people out there who need the skill because before it was a little more difficult. Uh, you know, you're stuck in your own room coding and you're not really thinking about those people out there who need your help. That's a bridge that I have consulting has uh, bridged over the last few years. I have cluster was sunsetted, but the idea there was to try and build the huger supercomputer cluster in, in Africa. So let's hope that that can be revived. Anyway, let's go back to the launch of the IHUB because that now leads me into Akira Chicks, which Judith told you um, about. So on the day that the IHUB was being launched, I looked around the room and one thing became clearly apparent. There were very few women. And I thought back about my own situation in my own classroom. I was one girl with maybe about 20 others who were doing a computer science course and a sea of men around us. And even looking at some of the people who would graduate before us, most of those would actually run away from any hardcore technology um, careers. So what a few of us did a month after the IHUB started was come together to try and think about what can we do to encourage other women to take up careers in technology like ourselves, and what can we do to actually change that mindset that this is not a field that women can actually work out of. And this is how Akira Chicks was born. Akira is a Japanese word that means intelligence and energy. I'm sure you're wondering, why Japanese and you're based in Nairobi? <laughs> I'm a huge fan of mangas. I'm a huge fan of um, the, the Japanese language in general. Uh, my nephew's half Japanese, so I figured, you know what? Oh, well, let me Google this. Let me find this out. And Akira stood up for us, so we said, okay, we can work with this. <laughs> and here we are five years later. What do we do as Akira Chicks? We are basically trying to nurture generations of women who use technology to develop solutions for Africa through training, mentorship, outreach, and networking. What we do with the training program is take young girls from low-income areas and take them through a one-year intensive course at absolutely no cost for them. Uh, that's introduction to computers, basic programming, entrepreneurship, and design, hoping that at the end of it all, they can use those skills that we've given them to go and create some sort of impact in their own communities whether it's um, alleviating the poverty they're in, start their own businesses, that kind of thing. Um, we do mentorship and outreach with young girls in high schools because we realize if we're actually going to get to the point where we get more women in technology, then we're going to have to start young because your career decisions are actually made while you're still in high school. And then the other thing that we do is networking activities where we try and bring, create spaces, whether it's online or offline, 
within an actual physical space, create an opportunity for us to come together and actually have face-to-face -face discussions around what are some of those challenges that we are facing as women in technology? What are the things that we can actually do to bridge this divide? Or having very specific, specifically themed uh, topics like whether it's digital security, how do we create safe spaces online for women? Um, what kind of digital security training do we actually require to make sure that we're actually safe um, online? So we've been doing this for around five years. I will talk about the impact in the next stage. So looking at that historical background into how we started and what we do, I think this is a very good segue into the actual kind of impact that we have had in the last um, few years. The Ushahidi platform has been used in more than 145 countries, translated into more than 45 languages for a wide variety of use cases, which I will now describe. Um, so back in January 2010, we all know that um, an earthquake hit Haiti. And at the time, the team was very small, maybe about five people. And we, want, we really couldn't, we wanted to make sure that we were using our own skills to help the people who were affected by the crisis at that time. So our then director of crisis mapping, Patrick Meyer, basically brought together a group of the Ushahidi team members and helped them set up an instance to deploy the platform. But of course, there was this main challenge in that you are all the way, miles away from Haiti, you don't know the language, and you're a team of four people. If you're receiving information, let's say about 1,000 reports over one hour, you are going to be overwhelmed. And so what they did, or rather what Patrick did, is also uh, brought together a group of volunteers from different parts of the world. They didn't necessarily have to be within Nairobi or within Fletcher School at the time, but people who could actually help process the incoming information, whether it was a report comes in, you go and approve it, have it go live on the map, translate whatever information is coming in in Creole into English, and then directly forwarding that over to a humanitarian re uh, responder. This was, I think, one of the really hugest use cases of crisis mapping that helped to revolutionize the whole thought of crisis response because this was the first time that we were seeing humanitarian responders receiving first-hand information from people who are being affected. This is what Ushahidi did at that point, helping to connect those people who ordinarily would have had to wait almost two weeks for somebody to actually come in and help them out in a very short period of time using technology that was very easy for them to access. Similar case uh, with the Japan earthquake, we had all this information collected and aggregated um, on the map that you're seeing on your screen right there. The other thing that the platform is used for as well is citizen journalism. So this group is an actually is a very interesting one because they've been doing this for a couple of years. They've been trying to document cases of sexual harassment against women in a bit to try and um, create some sort of behavioral change by creating awareness. So it's beyond them just actually taking this information and putting it live on the map. They're making use of it and doing research to provide better insights into, okay, what's happening in this specific area? What could those use cases be? And they've also kind of tried to develop a model that can be replicated in different countries. So we're seeing a lot of, sec um, a lot of maps trying to document cases of sexual harassment against women coming up based on the work that these guys <laughs> have been doing. Um, similarly, in Egypt, the maps or the, our platform played a really huge role trying to document um, the Egyptian revolution. Um, I think they set up three different maps. Um, the maps played a very important role in documenting the election, the revolution, and the constitutional amendments, trying to share exactly what was happening on the ground and to provide a better situational awareness for everybody around exactly what was going on around that time. And it's very interesting to see what the Egyptians used. They said, that they would use um, Flickr to uh, automatically pick photos and have them tagged and displayed on the homepage. Uh, they would use Facebook to try and create a lot more, um, to allow for a lot more interaction with some of their users. And what this culminated into was a really, a really powerful message online based on information that they had collected and aggregated and visualized on a map. One of the other use cases we've seen of Ushahidi is in election uh, monitoring. Um, we use it in Kenya back in 2013. We're seeing the Nigerians going to be using it in a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to be used in Burundi as well, just to create, uh, rather to provide some sense of accountability and openness in terms of what's going on around um, election monitoring around that time. Moving on to the impact that the IHUB has had. Ever since it started, we've seen more than 16,000 members sign up. So these are people who access the website online. These are people who actually come into the space. We've held 
possibly more than 500 events with people like Vinton Surf, just trying to create an opportunity for the users or the people within the space to learn from other people. Um, and we've also seen um, a lot of companies start out. So, you know, this is a group of four people coming into the space, meeting each other for the first time, clicking and discovering, you know what, we have a common goal, let's start a company. And we've seen more than 152 in the last um, four years. And with Akira Chicks, we've graduated more than 61 girls in the last five years. Um, and most of these girls go out and either join different industries, um, different companies within our technology ecosystem, or start their own businesses. Now, one of the ones that's very interesting to us is a girl called Florence Wanjugu who launched a website called Made in Nairobi. Now, what she's trying to do is promote local startups by providing a little more visibility. And this is someone who came into Akira Chicks with absolutely no idea how to use a computer, went through the training program, um, got linked up with the iHub UX lab where she's interning now, and has been able to build something this huge within one year. So you can see the kind of impact that we're trying to create. Um, hosting bi-weekly sessions with different girls in high schools and hosting boot camps during school holidays to provide a little more additional skill for these girls over, over a short period of time, hoping that they can use it beyond just uh, their own high school, and hosting events to try and bring all these women together. We held our very first Women in Technology conference last year that brought together more than 300 people um, from different parts of the country, just trying to make sure that we're celebrating women in computing in Africa. Now, this is where the interesting part, I'm sure this is what all of you have been waiting for. What are some of those lessons that we have learned from all of this work that we've been doing over the last uh, five years? It's not about the technology. It really isn't. <laughs> um, people tend to look at technology as the complete solution to all our problems and forget that you have to power the technology with something and that has to be human resource. Yes, technology can be more effective than throwing stones, but it will not be the complete solution. And let me show you an example of how exactly that works. Give you case, a case in point is the Uchaguzi platform, which was our Kenyan election project back in 2013. Um, we were able to collect more than 4,000 messages over a span of seven days. But that took a whole lot of work that you're seeing over on the side there. We had to host more than 50 training sessions with more than 218 volunteers locally within Nairobi and outside as well, just to try and make sure that we all understood what our common goal was and that we all understood what, what the goal of this platform would be and how to process the incoming information. So... That could not have happened without all of this. And it also involved a lot of work on our side to try and think about who exactly is our audience? What's the point? What's the incentive for these people to actually share the information on the map? Because it's not as easy as you just setting up a platform and then waiting for people to send in the information like magic. They need to know about it. What tools do they have access to? Um, are we going to be setting up a map where people can only tweet and you're thinking about 90% of the people who you're trying to reach only having mobile phones? That's the kind of thinking that we, had to, that we had to employ during this project and the kind of thinking that we're really trying as much as possible to share out there with people, with people outside the world. Um, now, with Akira Chicks, when we started out, our focus was purely on just giving these girls training on how to use tech. And then we realized after the first year that this was not going to be enough because you're looking at the background of where these girls are coming from. You know, they need a holistic kind of training. And that's led us to kind of... Um, structure our program in a way that not only has the technology components into it as well, but adding in communication skills, making sure that we're providing avenues for them to get placements. So partnering with different organizations to make sure that that's happening. And this is all because we were not focusing on just the tech. It's focusing around the kind of impact that this would have on those people. What exactly do they need? And that's one thing that I do want all of you to leave here thinking about. Who's your audience? What do they need? What tools do they have access to? Don't forget about the tech at the very beginning. Just try and focus and put yourselves in the shoes of those people who you're actually trying um, to reach. The other lesson that we have learned is that when you put clever people in the same room, interesting things tend to happen. <laughs> and it, this, this room doesn't necessarily have to be a physical space. It can be an online one. So again, thinking, thinking back to the kind of audience or the kind of people who you're trying to reach, 
think about what tools do they already have access to. In our case for Shahidi, because our community is largely global, we've created online spaces, whether that's um, um, online portals on the wiki or whether that's a Skype room, but just creating a space where all of you can come together and brainstorm, right? And you look at how Shahidi started, it's the same thing. We had four or five people who had a very clear common goal come together and start a deployment, start up a map just to share information around one specific crisis that has ended up being used more than 50,000 times. They didn't know that that was going to happen. Look at Akira Chicks. When we started out, it was just, we want to try and encourage more girls to take up careers. We never thought we would span out into actually doing training. Look at how Uchaguzi worked out. We had all these volunteers just sitting together and creating such a powerful impact by allowing for all this information to come in and have that visualized by everybody else out there. And same thing with the Haiti earthquake, because that's when a group of people called the crisis mappers or the standby task force actually began. It was through that specific volunteer um, situation that these people realized, you know what, we have a lot of these kind of crises happening. We really need to set up a space, or rather set up a group of people who'll be able to be activated in a, in a span of a couple of days or a couple of minutes or a couple of hours to make sure that this information is easily processed. So it saved a lot of time in terms of um, sourcing for volunteers, sourcing for people who are already familiar with the technology, right? Let your audience be your guide. So circling back to the very first statement, thinking about who your audience exactly is and what, what they need, making sure that you're providing value. Now, I think one of the reasons why we, uh, why Ushahidi has had so much success is because we looked back at the kind of people who were trying to target, or the kind of people who we needed to reach, and it was very clear that the easiest way to be as inclusive as possible was by using the tool people already have access to, the most ubiquitous one, which is the mobile phone. So we've used a mobile fast approach that has ended up being replicated severally. Uchaguzi ended up picking out um, data, about 90% of the data that was received came largely from SMS. So the key, the key message here is to make sure that you're building technology that is appropriate to the people that you're trying to reach. Making sure that you've actually put yourself in their shoes and seeing exactly what kind of impact that that will have. The other thing that you need to think about is feedback. Um, I think one of our co-founders likes to say that the key to behavioral change lies in feedback loops. Um, let me give you an example. If in the case of Uchaguzi, when somebody would send in a text message, if that text message didn't end up being acted upon, then you know you wouldn't really be driven to send that message back again. But by making sure that whatever information is being received is actionable, and this person having visibility on the kind of action that's being taken based on that, then you'll be motivated to kind of send that back through. And that's one of the things that we're also really trying as much as possible to encourage amongst all of our users. We've developed toolkits to kind of help you frame, frame that, uh, help you think about um, who are the different partners that you need to bring on board to make sure that if you're receiving this kind of information that it'll be acted upon. In the case of Uchaguzi, it was coming up, uh, identifying partners in the law enforcement agencies, um, humanitarian responders just in case there's any sort of um, humanitarian crisis or human rights uh, violations, and just making sure that that was actually um, being taken care of around uh, that time. The other thing that I have learned within that time period is about openness and collaboration. Now, when you look at what the power of open source tools or just openness in general actually does is it allows you as a user or allows you as different communities to stand on the shoulders of giants. It allows you to build upon things that already exist. It allows you not to have to start from scratch, which is what the Ushahidi platform kind of provides because when you're looking at a way of trying to collect and aggregate this information, then it's very easy for you to do. Think about what the iHub does, providing a space where you don't have to you can come in and have those resources already available to you. Those networks have already been created for you. You don't have to go out and search for them. You already have a space where you can go and actively do your testing, already have a pool of resources where you can go and do um, your research. And then in terms of collaboration, thinking about not reinventing the wheel. So if there are already existing communities or existing people who you can reach out to, do that as well. Because um, through that, you'll have a much bigger and a much more effective force um, moving forward. Now, 
I think what we've done in Kenya right now is built an ecosystem that's serving as a proof of concept for replication across the entire world. Because when you look at how Ushahidi and IHAB and Akira Chicks work together, or how all of that beginning kind of sprouted out, it's very clear that working together makes you a much stronger force. So I'll leave you with one quote where we say, alone you go faster, but together you go further. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, there's one. Thank you very much. Um, I had two questions. One small one. Are you also working together with, um, what's her name, Jamila? She had this really cool tool, a farm, where they work for the farmers, and mm -hmm. I was thinking you might work together with her. So she is actually one of the first, the first members of Akira Chicks, and they actually started M Farm through that, because what happened is I think we got a call for a hackathon that was going to be happening in Nairobi, and they sat down for four days, hacked on it as a group, and ended up starting a company that has been in existence for those close to three, four years. So that's the kind of serendipity that we're talking about, you know, seeing how all of that connects together. So yes, I do know them. Okay, so what MFAM does is they've created an, an application on mobile that bridges a gap between farmers and people who um, are looking for farm produce, kind of doing away with the middleman position, because what would happen then is that the middlemen would kind of go and escalate the prices in, in a way that wasn't beneficial to the farmer. So this provides insights to the farmer on directly in terms of what the market needs and what the market prices would be. And then also for users like ourselves who are looking for farm produce, allowing us to have that direct connection with the people who are creating that produce. And the, and the second question was um, about the feedback lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I see a map of Cairo, and I s or, or maybe the Kenyan elections, mm -hmm. how does this incident and report turn into action? I was interested in that. Okay, so um, in that case, what happens is we, again, the technology can only do so much for you. So how that feedback happens lies in the partnerships because when you look at what we do, we focus on making sure that the technology allows for pulling in the, the data, but the action can only be done by a group of people who have the mandate to do that. So in a case of uh, the Kenyan election or Cairo, they have to have different partners already identified who have kind of the same, rather have a common goal to make sure that that is happening. So the information comes onto the platform, you forward it to the specific people who will be able to act on it, and then create a flag on the report itself that this is something that has been acted upon. Or in cases where this is something really huge, actually we had one example back um, for the Kenyan election itself. We received a text message about a group of people congregating back in the coast or uh, murders around that, and we were able to send that information to the police in a matter of fif about 15 minutes, and in 15 minutes we were able to deploy more of the, um, more of the police to go and make sure that that, was, that that was contained. So that's how response would be added in. Yeah, so partnerships. Was a question over there? Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say how much I love Ushahidi. I think it's such a great tool, and you empowered so many people across the world, really, to um, Thank you. our civil society. Yeah, and I've and I've seen so many um, and read already uh, so many great examples of how your tools come to use. It's absolutely impressive. There's one thing that I've always wondered about, and it's marvelous that I can ask this question. Um, so, how do you deal with the issue of data quality? I mean, mm -hmm. for instance, particularly in the case of civil unrest, a partisan group might use your tool to actively disinform, and you know try to channel police forces the wrong way. Mm. You, you might have cases of vandalism even for careless people who just you know, screw up your data and, and report cases that don't even exist. And there are also, of course, marginal errors probably as well, people who just pick the wrong button or whatever. So I've always asked, do you some, do some form of verification or how do you deal with data quality? So right now, within the platform, the verification is largely manual. Like It's really heavily dependent on a group of people who really understand what the theme of your map is to kind of help you sift through that. But we've, been, we've tried as much as possible to try and automate that process. So that's one of the things we're going to be doing with Ushahidi version 3. But um, we developed a platform called Swift River that would 
help to identify the credibility of a source automatically. This could be based on the number of reports this person has actually sent in that have been approved or verified, and that would be a good enough indicator. But it's largely manual and it will vary. So you'll have um, different verification mechanisms being stricter for certain situations as compared to other ones. But it's fairly fairly manual. So that's where your 90% your comes in. Your, your team of um, people who really understand what the platform is all about. Um, but the other thing as well is adding in possibilities of being able to overlay other sources of data because we've always identified the fact that collecting data from the crowd, um, there'll always be that, that risk of bias. So adding in options of whether it's overlaying official data and having that be a way to kind of do that comparison is very, very important. There were one question here and then two more. Um, hi, I was um, wondering how um, is the political situation in your country? Um, training people, are you actually supported by the government or um, where do you get your funding from? I mean, training for one year for free um, <laughs> doesn't go with a lot of resources. Do you, do you have private funders or how, how does it work? So with Akira Chicks, um, in the first year we funded ourselves. We all have full-time jobs. So like I work at Ushahidi, but Akira Chicks is my side project. So the first year we did it all completely from our own pockets. But over the last a few years, we've applied for a couple of grants. Google Rise has been a really huge supporter. We've had InfoDev as well. But right now our hugest funder is a Swedish international development agency who've provided us with the funds that allows us to run that program for for as long a period as we need and actually get a space where the girls can actually go out and, and learn from and provide them with uh, computers, at least from the Akiratik side of things. But yes, we are grant funded. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. They actually do like our work. And one of the things we're trying to do as well is use this as a proof of concept for kind of disrupting the current curriculum because we're trying to be as very focused in a specific way and make sure that we're providing as much value within that one year as possible. So, yeah. Hi. First of all, I'd like to say as well, this, um, I was very impressed. It was terrific work. Um, I really think you're doing something very good there. Thank you. I have a question concerning Haiti. Um, and maybe I just didn't follow you um, well enough, but... You said you were four people at the time, and if you if you establish a crisis response mechanism in a country where you, A, are not at home, and B, apparently had no network then, how did you actually, I mean, how did people know you were out there at the time? And on which elephant's back were you riding, basically, is my question. Um, so, I should have made this clear in the beginning. So. The Haiti response was actually a, an emotional one because we had friends who were stuck there at the time. Yes. So we used them to kind of help get word out. But then we also had to do a lot of outreach to different organizations that would need this kind of data. So whether it was the Red Cross and the like. Yeah. I wasn't there at the time, but that's... Yeah. Hello. Um, I also admire Ujahidi. And I, maybe it's a follow-up question to your question. Because there are somewhere um, the people that are, you know, that have the inf that generating the information. They know about an incident, mm -hmm. uh, and you, there are you running that platform. But normally, people living somewhere in Haiti or in Kazakhstan don't know that Ushahidi exists, and that yeah. don't know where to send their SMS or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So that bridge is unclear to me. Who bridges that gap? Who bridges that gap? Let me take you back to that specific slide. That one. <laughs> so we are not the ones who would deploy in Pakistan or we're not the ones who will deploy in Haiti. We'll rely on our network of volunteers or our community members who are already based there. So, you know, you look at the Haiti, uh, the, the first Haiti deployment. That was um, a very good way to kind of show the possibilities that the platform would provide. And the people who helped us during that time ended up continuing to use the platform over and over for other things, which helped us to build a community around our tools. Yeah. So we are not the ones who actively deploy. We really heavily rely on our own networks within there. And then 
for them, they need to make sure that they have a very extensive outreach campaign. So again, going back to thinking about who your users are, where are they, what tools do they have access to, so that you can decide, are we going to be using campaigns, online campaigns, are we going to be using posters, are we going to use text, are we going to use radio? But that's normally up to them, depending on the context of what you're deploying the map for. Yeah. Okay, are there any, any more questions? Yes, very good. Thanks, Angela. Um, my name is Timo, and I actually have a follow-up question to the second question we had, which was task management versus incident reporting. Mm -hmm. And you said at the moment, I mean, the way I know Ushahidi, it's a very good platform to say this house is on fire. But it's not a very good platform to say like, oh, I'm going to go and put out the fire and then report back, oh, the fire has been put out. So incidents tend to accumulate. Mm -hmm. And you s I was just wondering with like, you know, version three or something like that, and I work mainly in humanitarian assistance, mm -hmm. is this something that, you know, where you're thinking about connecting it more with task management applications? Yes, Thank you. that's actually one of the really hugest ones, and we're calling that um, workflows. So first of all, being able to actually break that out into all those different tasks and be able to act, um, very clearly identify what requires action, what doesn't require action, and who's actually doing it. Because currently it's required us to build plugins to make sure that that's visible or add in a manual process, whether it's actually adding in a description or things like that. So that is something that we're working on. Yes. But it's something that's still worked on from a manual perspective. Yeah. OK. Um, I have a question. In terms of community engagement, um, what, how, how do you go about that? I mean, for, for, your own, for your own community more. OK. So like I said before, because our community is very global. Um, we need to find ways of being able to connect with them because at times we, not mean, we may not necessarily have a physical space for us to do that. So we rely heavily on mailing lists. We have a Skype channel. We have IRC for the people who are a lot more technology savvy. And then we also have forums through which people can actually come in and uh, share content with each other. So it's very, it's, it's very heavily geared to online, online engagement at the moment. And then once in a while, we'll host large-scale events where we can bring people together. Or for um, looking at the, how the Ushahidi team is spread out, people who are in different areas can actually host meetups within their own little areas. But that's just one way. Um, I don't really think I'd focus a lot more on the channels of how we engage with them as opposed to more about how you provide value. Because there's something Amy said, you know, I'd rather have you know, 10 people who are actively engaged on the mailing list and 10,000 people who are keep sending information to and they don't really do anything about it. So the key to community engagement is really identifying what that incentive is for that person to be a part of your community, right? And making sure that you've clearly defined what your community is in the first place. Is it centered around just people who use the platform? Is it centered around people who help you translate it? You need to make sure that you have that definition very clearly defined and make sure that you have very good entry points for people to identify as being a part of a part of that a part of that community. Yeah. Good. Are there any any more questions? Then I have one last one, <laughs> if I may, which is linking back to campaigning, because actually um, in the room there are a lot of campaigners as well. So, um, and we, yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering what would be your best um, example of how to use Ushahidi for campaigning, really, for um, maybe from, you mentioned when we talked earlier, you mentioned something about like corruption in, in Kenya and so on. Yeah. Maybe you could elaborate on that example. Mm -hmm. um, just like really for campaigning um, rather than information gathering. Using the platform more for campaigning. So I would look at it not as a conclusive or the only thing around your campaign, but just as one way. And the way I'm looking at it is creating awareness about something. So it could be that you use it to um, talk to, I don't know, have people share their opinions about things. Let me actually use a different example. So um, back in, I think it was 2010, uh, there was a stockout. And what a stockout is, is um, it's basically a, 
a deficiency or a shortage of medical supplies in a specific area. And we had uh, the government trying in, I think in Uganda and in Kenya, trying to kind of downplay that there was actually a, that there was actually a health, uh, a health supply, medical supply shortage. And so what a group of human activists did is set up the map and decided, you know what, we're going to go to the people who are actually experiencing this shortage. You went to a hospital and you didn't have aspirin. Can you send us that text message and let us know? And that was a very good way of being able to carry that information and go and you know, show the government, this is real-time information that we're receiving from the ground to tell you that this is exactly what's happening. So that was one way of creating awareness. And then it kind of switched the conversation away from he said, she said into, okay, this is what the crowd is saying. This is what we have. If we correlate it, then what are we seeing there? So I don't know whether that helps to show you how exactly you would, how exactly you'd make use of it, but yeah. It's an example. Thank you. Thank you so much for also answering all our questions. Thank you, Angela, for coming here and sharing your experience. <laughs>